All right. That should be fun to watch. <laughs> Ready? Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to your Public Works and Gang Reduction Committee. Uh, I am joined by my colleagues, uh, Councilmember Rue and Rodriguez. And uh, Sheriff us are there general public comment cards? There, I guess there are. Okay, and we have, and we also have some multiple, I've got a couple items I want to take on consent, but uh, we have some multiple uh, card items, so why don't we dispense with those first. And um, for two minutes, we'll have Mr. Wayne from Encino, and then Ms. Marut Ramirez. Mr. Wayne from Encino. Anyway, yeah, I forgot to bring my puppet, damn it. I left my puppet in my car. Okay, so what we got here is lots of public works. Now, it's good that you've taken over the situation, but we, let's compliment Joe Buscaino that he was able to successfully rob FEMA of about $500,000 for a new speedboat. And this is a good thing. Even though everybody in Puerto Rico is dying over there and doesn't have water, we can get $400,000 for FEMA for a speedboat for the San Pedro Harbor. Let's give them a hand. That's right. See, because that, that's what it is. I mean, let's not give the $490,000 to Puerto Rico for people that need it for FEMA. Let's take $500,000 from FEMA please, please so we can have a fucking speedboat. Please boat. speak to the items on Isn't the agenda. Isn't that great? So, 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 see, asshole David Roos, he's fucking scratching his head. We take $500,000. Please speak to the items on the agenda. I am. You took $500,000 from FEMA when you could have given it to Puerto Rico for their relief efforts, but instead, you'd rather keep the money for a fucking speedboat. It's not on so the agenda. Your fucking asshole clients can come down and go, can I ride the speedboat? Yeah. It's not, it's not yeah, on the agenda. It is on the, it's about public works. It's That's, about public works. Do you works, want to reserve that for public comment? The Board of Public Works relative to the board's you want to report. reserve that for public comment? You can talk about items that I'm are not talking, on the agenda, but in the committee's jurisdiction. It's germane to the verbal report. In the verbal report, you took $500,000 of FEMA money for a speedboat when you could give it to the people of Puerto Rico right now that need that money. They're dying right now. They don't have electricity. They don't have clean water. But you motherfuckers would rather keep the money for a fucking speedboat. So you, you guys have a nice speedboat while people in Puerto Rico are dying. Racist piece of shit, Thank motherfucker you. cocksuckers. Ms. Ramirez. And we'll take that as his public comment. Thank you very much. Um, item number two, um, Jason Seward, and I'm also consolidating um, number two and number three. So Jason Seward and um, I guess uh, Todd Sargent. If you have been hand selected by Eric Garcetti, then I have a serious reservations about uh, your dedication, honesty, integrity, commitment to the legal law-abiding citizens and the American citizens uh, regarding your ethical performance. Now, I know that Eric Garcetti is a dishonest, malevolent viper, and again, he is uh, contrary to innovation and peak performance. Again, and he has not hired military veterans. And uh, again, we have, he has campaigned ferociously before that he would do a lot for the military veterans and clean up LA, but sad to our dismay, LA is in shambles. So is public works and so is the gang epidemic. We have um, a monumental problem. And uh, number five, on the pilot pro project regarding addressing the backlogs of concrete and street repairs, ladies and gentlemen, we have a problem. Um, Los Angeles, again, and um, in California, we have concrete street repairs because most of these problems are incurred by these goddamn wetbacks and gangbangers. A lot of them chisel out the cement 
and they drill the, the street concretes because they mark their turfs everywhere in Los Angeles. Look at the streets. They are marked or chiseled, hammered, drilled, and destroyed by these goddamn gangbangers. I have seen them when I slept out on the streets, how they mark their street and their turf. Everywhere you go, look at every block. It is signed. It is, it is designated by a certain gang, and they know what their turf is, and they drill, drill at night, turf, and hammer. They hammer all the streets, and uh, I guess. Thank, thank you, Ms. Ramirez. I don't get uh, my one minute. Uh, at the end of the meeting, we'll do general oh, okay. public comment. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, um, colleagues, I'd like to propose that we take items two, three, and six on consent. Is there any objection to that? Could I just say something about item two? Certainly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to note item two is uh, Mr. Jason Seward, and I just wanted to really thank him for all his service. He's a good friend, and um, I know he's renewed. Well, this is he's going to be serving his first full term, so we just really want to thank him for his service and all his great works on the commission as well as in the community. So thank you. Thank you for your service. Okay, seeing no objection, items two, three, and six are approved on consent. And that brings us to item number one. And we are honored here today to have the uh, Public Works Commission President, Kevin James. And item, one is a verbal, item number one is a verbal report from the Board of Public Works relative to the board's top priorities. Thank you. And, and Mr. James, this is one of those items that we could take six different meetings and fill the entire meetings with all of these priorities because you've got big ones. So we're going to have you do your presentation if it's okay with you as you go through each one we may jump in with questions it's typically how we do uh i've always done in my committees i have the head of each department come and and give us their top priorities and and it's a little bit more of a dialogue than a typical item uh because you know there's multiple items on it so colleagues i'll put that out there for you as as we move forward so we great thank you um and let me just say i i i <laughs> I'll start with an apology. I, I recognize that the, um, the agenda item asked for our top priorities, and so we tried to narrow it down. So we got it down to 12, and I thought, well, I'll cheat a little bit by I'll call eight of them policy priorities, and that way I kept it under 10 to satisfy Mr. Popach. Uh, and then we, uh, and, and the other four are operational. Um, I'll talk about, um, uh, uh, about half of the policy items um, uh, our board vice president, um, Heather Repenning, will talk about the other half, and then we have our superstar executive officer here, Fernando Campos, on the operational uh, policies, and we're happy to take your questions on any of them, either at the end or along the way, whatever you want. Great, thank you. Um, let me just first say that the last time that I stood here um, uh, uh, with uh, Councilwoman Rodriguez, it was on her last day, um, she was sitting one chair over, um, but <laughs> um, but um, it is um, uh, with honor and excitement and pleasure that uh, that I see um, uh, our board vice pre previous board vice president, now councilwoman, um, who climbed a mountain, got over a hump, um, any number of ways that you want to describe it for. Uh, for so many uh, aspects of her district and the city, but for our Board of Public Works as well. Um, so congratulations, um, and frankly, congratulations to all of us. Um, uh, we look forward to, um, to the partnership with someone who uh, knows the board as well as anyone. Um, so thank you, um, and, um, and thank you for running. Um, so with that, let me talk about um, uh, some of our, our top priorities. Um, recognizing that there's so much that we do, and I've said it before, so I'll keep it very brief this time. Um, it is um, uh, just an excellent and awesome responsibility, the job that, uh, that the mayor and the council has entrusted upon us. That's not lost on us. Um, the, I want to start with um, uh, pavement preservation um, and also not get away from that without including street sweeping. Um, we have worked, as you know, very hard to um, set records with our pavement preservation program. 
um, and improve the pavement condition index. We've had success in both of those areas. That's a continuing top priority for the Board of Public Works. And the reason I mention it first um, is because of the Measure M aspect that is um, developing as we speak on funding that's related to the pavement preservation program that will be linked uh, to Vision Zero led by the Department of Transportation. Um, on the street sweeping, um, you know, we have often thought in partnership, of course, with the Bureau of Street Services that especially with new technology, that there are opportunities to, um, to perhaps reform the street sweeping program in ways that are more beneficial to the cleanliness of our streets in Los Angeles. And with technology, looking at ways to do that without increasing the number of sweepers or motor sweeper operators. So that's something that is also a priority for the Board of Public Works in partnership with the Bureau. Something that has been a top priority uh, for me, I think it will continue to be for, uh, for my remaining years in this role in, um, at Public Works, is working on our uh, tree canopy and our urban canopy in the city of Los Angeles. Some years ago, one of your colleagues asked me before a budget hearing what, if I had to choose one budget priority, what would it be? Um, and it was uh, related to tree trimming. Um, we have increased our forces on tree trimming, um, but I would still like to see the reinstatement, if you will, of the Urban Forestry Division to the position that it was in before the Great Recession. And that is um, a top priority as well. And by the way, um, again, this is an area where technology, and technology is able to do so much in the way that, that we deliver city services. For Councilwoman Rodriguez to now be the chairman of the Technology Committee, she was, by the way, the chairman of the Technology Committee of the Board of Public Works as, as well. Um, and uh, so there's no better person to have in, uh, in that role because technology and public works go hand in hand, whether we're talking about what uh, Commissioner Repenning will talk about in a moment with clean streets, with our pavement condition index, with street sweeping, um, and, and also with our, with our tree canopy. Um, there are a number of models that um, have taken place in other cities uh, where with Google Maps and uh, perhaps a partner in a, in a public-private uh, partnership, we'll be able to uh, make more progress on our inventory of street trees. And finally, before I pass this over to Commissioner Repenning, um, the sidewalk repair program, of course, 30 years, $31 million a year, $1.4 billion. That is a top priority and will be for the Board of Public Works, um, the Bureau of Engineering, and the Bureau of Street Services. There are interesting aspects, uh, so much to the, uh, the sidewalk repair program. Obviously, we have a backlog. We have ADA requirements that we need to meet. We have various priorities that are mandated in the Willett Settlement. So there's constant coordination. Um, that takes place, and that's a, a top priority as well. And so, um, in, in the interest of time, and to give Commissioner Repenning the opportunity uh, to talk about some of the items that she focuses primarily on, um, I will forego all of the other things that I have on my sheet that I thought I might try and slip in, but can't. But maybe on questions. So, Commissioner Repenning. Sure. Um, thank you, President James, and thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and committee members, council members. Um, for having me here today, uh, congratulations um, from me as well to Councilmember Rodriguez, um, and thank you. You know, I had big shoes to fill coming in as Vice President after you left, but I've tried to uh, to do your work justice. Um, and so I wanted to touch base today on a few of the items. I, I'm the board liaison to the Bureau of Sanitation, and so I work on some uh, some of their their programs. Um, including Clean, Clean Streets LA. Um, you all know Clean Streets. It's been around for a couple of years now. Um, it's very popular out in our communities. Um, and, you know, for us, we've got now data. And I, I want to thank Councilmember Busca. You know, you were, you were involved in the creation of this program and really pushed to make sure that we were putting back services to actually proactively clean our neighborhoods, address illegal dumping, clean out our alleys. Um, so thank you for, for all of your hard work in helping shape and create this program. Um, 
for me, it's important that we just continue to make progress and that we are, are making regular and strategic use of the data that we have, showing us those areas of need, that we're really continuing to focus on those areas. Um, one challenge that we have is that our Clean Streets crews are the same crews that are um, helping uh, do the cleaning for um, homeless encampments. And so that is a, 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 a comp competition for those resources. And while we know that um, cl cleanup around our homeless encampments is very uh, critical for um, public health, um, we want to make sure that we continue to make progress in doing the proactive cleaning that we know um, all of you want to see uh, get done. Um, so we'll, we're continuing to do that. We actually have a Clean Streets Challenge open now if any of your communities want to um, apply for grants to help be part of this program. Um, as well, business inclusion program, this has been a, a priority for our entire board, really, um, continuing the work um, Councilwoman Rodriguez put in um, uh, reforming our Babin system. Um, we're really committed to making sure that the dollars that we're spending um, from the department are not just being spent to provide services or build infrastructure, but that those dollars are actually going back into the community to help support our local economy. And so we've looked at how can we do a better job at this. Um, uh, Commissioner Davis and I created um, an ad hoc committee uh, a business advisory committee. Um, uh, it, was it was made up of, of about 30 people who representing primes and subcontractors that do regular business with us. We met with them four times. We put together a, a, a list of recommendations that includes um, just doing a lot more outreach, a lot more matchmaking, um, but also trying some pilot programs um, to continue to increase um, the diversity of, uh, of the contracting that we do so that we're including minority-owned businesses, women-owned businesses, small businesses, disabled veteran-owned businesses, and making sure that those dollars are being spent here in our communities with the people that we want to see benefit um, from the work that we're doing. Uh, One Water LA, you know, this has really been um, uh, an effort to try to integrate thinking about water into all of the planning that we're doing around infrastructure in our city. Um, we know that the drought um, that we were facing for several years, we did have a lot of rain last winter, but we know that um, those drought conditions and the shortage of water is an ongoing topic for us in LA. We wanna continue to build out our local water supplies so that we're not dependent on sources of water that we um, really shouldn't be relying on given the realities of climate change. Um, and so we wanna build out our stormwater capture systems. We want to build it. We want to clean our our wastewater and use it uh, in, in the maximum number of ways possible. Um, and then, of course, we want to conserve water. And so, really trying to integrate thinking about water into um, the many areas that we work in as a city. That's what this program has been about. There's been a lot of work among department staff and with stakeholders. Um, and then, finally, zero waste. Uh, now known as Recicla, our franchise program. Um, it's a, you know, a, a huge program that um, is going to uh, redefine the way that we think about um, waste disposal in our city. Um, and it's going to mandate um, recycling. And so right now, the contractors who were selected as part of the program are out there. They're in your communities. Um, they're working with the customers who are commercial accounts and multifamily buildings above four units to help people understand you know, what the program's about to bring recycling out to them. For us as a city, we are in contract management mode and it is very important for us to look at every opportunity to make sure that the customer service provisions in the contract are followed and to make sure that our haulers are spending the time with the customers that they're supposed to per the contract so that people understand that they can recycle and save money in this program and so that they understand how to put together the best package of services that will keep their bills as low as possible. Um, so we're putting a lot of work into that right now. Um, so those, those are the main topics that um, I wanted to touch on and I'm gonna turn it back over to our board president. Um, I left one off intentionally um, and that I wanted to close on on policy before we go on operational because um, of two reasons, um, well, three reasons. Um, but one of them was um, I knew this would uh, be most Im uh, important to your newest member, um, Councilwoman Rodriguez, with street lighting. 
you know, our Bureau of Street Lighting um, is the nation's leader when it comes to uh, technology and the work that they're doing with the LED conversions. And the big secret that I was supposed to keep regarding smart nodes, although I have discovered that that's already in the press, so I'm going to talk a bit about it today. Um, I know that we're going to be doing um, a press event uh, uh, related to it very soon. It is um, the, the, uh, the first one, the pilot is on uh, Wilshire Boulevard, and it is a street light pole that has, I don't know, maybe six or seven different categories of data and information and capability that it can deal with that really does kind of move the above ground facility and telecom street furniture, if you will, into the 21st century. Um, and that is a good segue to the next thing I want to say about the Bureau of Street Lighting. This year in particular, when I really, well since 2017, we have had, as many of you know, because it's been very prominent in your respective districts, um, significant number of applications of above ground facilities for the build out to 5G. Um, and in addition to that, just other infrastructure and telecom build out that's taking place because of the growth of technology around the city, and indeed around the world. Um, the Bureau of Street Lighting has been the primary department, not just in public works, but in the city that has worked with our Bureau of Engineering and the telecom providers, the neighborhood leaders, the neighborhood councils, and your council offices in finding co-location opportunities to keep the, um, the necessary additional street furniture um, and, and like infrastructure from being uh, put unnecessarily in the public right of way, thereby cluttering the public right of way, and thereby improving the quality of life and the beautification of our neighborhoods. And that has been uh, this year really a, it's been a significant amount of work. Just this morning at the Board of Public Works, we had the last kind of large batch of previous applications for above ground facilities that were withdrawn from our agenda, and we're doing this in clumps at a time because the neighborhood, the council office, the, the bureaus, and the telecoms came together and found agreements on co-location, which, by the way, the film industry loves too because it doesn't interrupt the streetscape that they need to work with in on-location filming. So I wanted to close off the, the policy priorities with street lighting, um, and uh, then we have, as I said, our superstar executive officer who does great work for us, um, and for many of you at the Board of Public Works, um, Fernando Campos, who uh, handles all of our operational um, uh, goings on in the Board of Public Works. Good afternoon, honorable council members, Dr. Campos, executive officer with the Board of Public Works. I also echo the president and vice president to send our, my congratulations to Councilwoman uh, Rodriguez uh, for her election. So glad to see you again and um, definitely a great addition to this committee. Um, many, I, I'm also very pleased to be before you um, speaking about the operational side of the house. Board of Public Works is considered almost like the sixth arm of the Department of Public Works and sometimes overseen simply because we are the smallest piece, but I believe we are the glue that sticks everyone together. Not only do we have the governing body, we have the commissioners there, but we also have a centralized accounting function, financial function, and one of the roles and responsibilities that I take on as, as uh, executive officer is to oversee the construction of all the bids that go out through in, throughout the entire city of Los Angeles. The budget for the Department of Public Works is about $750 million. When I add in all the special funds that we account for, it's close to about a billion dollars. So we are the third largest city department as a whole, and that's something that falls on the shoulders of the Board of Public Works. So I wanted to highlight that um, in this presentation. There are four points that I want to make today and uh, regarding our operations. The first point is really looking at our Public Works Trust Fund Nexus study. This is a study that was uh, released about Three months ago, it was an initiative that we proposed to your council about a year and a half ago, and with your support, we were able to secure $150,000 in budget. It may sound like a very small dollar amount, however, it took us a couple of uh, times to, or tries to get this money. With this money, we are looking at, um, looking at our Public Works Trust Fund to release about $12 million that we currently have in our pre-89, post-89 restricted funds. 
what that means to us is that we're looking at what other municipalities are doing across the entire state of California to determine how do we have comply with the State Fee Mitigation Act of 1990. We are currently doing a survey. We hired our contractor to come in and, and look at the, the best practices across the entire city. We have preliminary results that will be responded to and provided to our Board of Public Works. We think that will come around October. The entire study will be completed around December of this year and the proposal is to have a proposed, or the concept is to have a proposed policy back to the Board of Public Works sometime in February and March with some results in terms of where, do, where does this $12 million reside, which council district gets the most uh, bucket of money or who has the most amount of money for what purpose and we will be making those recommendations to your council first to our Board of Public Works and then to your council sometime in February March of 2018 just in time for the budget deliberations I think that's going to be a very topical time for the discussion so again thank you for th your support that's something that we've been working on um, over the last several years in the last two years excuse me, in the last two years, we've transferred about $22 million in Public Works Trust Fund money into the general fund. This year, we are on target to transfer an additional $14 million of general fund and, and special fund monies. Um, so coming up with an aggregate total of $36 million over the last three years. And this is something that was not occurring in the last five years prior to my appointment here uh, with the Board of Public Works. So I think that's one way and one value that not only the executive officer brings, but also the focus and the commitment from our Board of Public Works, our commissioners, to look at this problem and really dive deep and peel the onion to look at what can we do with the Public Works Trust Fund and how can we leverage those funds to move forward with uh, construction and making our city uh, great. The second point is our graffiti abatement um, and community beautification services. Our current contracts are going to expire this June of 2018. We are looking at drafting a new RFP. We are planning to release two sets of RFPs, one for our graffiti abatement services and second for our community beautification services. We are currently partnering with 13 community-based organizations. We anticipate continuing that partnership um, and also uh, working with your council district to get those contracts approved on or before June of 2018. Just to give you an idea, the mayor has committed to improve graffiti and, and uh, abate graffiti uh, within a within a 24-hour period by 90%. To give you an idea as to where we were about two years ago, we were about 55%. Last year, we ended about 76, and we are on our way to increase that number for this year. That was made that was made possible because your council committed to an additional two million dollars this year to uh, abate graffiti. So we are now working with additional resources. We're able to deploy more resources using our community-based organizations and be able to and also respond to these requests in a more timely manner. So we thank you for your commitment. We thank you for your support. We are seeing great results and we are striving towards getting to that 90% goal um, in the near future. The third point is leveraging our best available technology that's out there. As many city departments that may come before you uh, and have come before you, our technology at the Board of Public Works is aging. We are now about four to five years uh, post our replacement policy. ITA has a four-year replacement policy on our computers. We have exceeded that about 66% of our staff is working with data technology. So we are proposing um, some new requests to the mayor's office to consider to be included in next year's budget. We would love your support in not only leveraging best available technology, but digitizing our workplace. We have made great strides with the Board of Public Works, not only automating our board agenda process, but we'd like to also start incorporated speaker cards, um, just like we have here in the, in the room. So eventually this room will become more digitized, in which we will get rid of paper. The other thing that we're looking at is digitizing and automating the board packets, just like you have your binders before you. We would actually provide our commissioners iPads where we can download the information to them, have that information virtually available to them, and reduce our dependence on paper and then um, reduce our carbon footprint. The fourth and last point is our petroleum office. As you are aware, we um, transferred that function to the Board of Public Works about a year ago. The council just approved the ordinances, the functional uh, transfer ordinances that basically transfers the function from the Department of Transportation to the Board of Public Works along with the city administrative officer back to the Board of Public Works or to the Board of Public Works. That just occurred last uh, yesterday. Um, we are 
we've had our patrol administrator for about a year. We are looking at hiring our first individual uh, one year post his hiring uh, next month, and then we are planning to hire one additional uh, analyst in November and then an inspector in January. It's been a start. Uh, it's been a slow startup. However, there's been many things that we've had to confront. One is transferring the function over. Two, preparing the policies uh, and procedures that are necessary to make sure that we are effectively deploying this office and and um, releasing what we need to um, re releasing the new RFPs to do an evaluation study. The evaluation study basically what that means is that the Supreme Court with Jax versus. Uh, uh, city of Santa Barbara indicated that in order for us to establish a value to our franchise, we need to have some sort of reasonable value or evaluation of our franchise. We will be preparing and releasing an RFP to look at what that reasonable value is uh, for our franchise. We have currently 42 contracts that are currently in place, but they will be expiring. One of those being Southern California Gas Company, as you may be aware. Overall, overall, overall our petroleum administration revenue is about $20 million. These contracts, these 42 contracts that I'm mentioning, um, are the ones that generate this revenue. So we are looking at renewing them, making sure that we have some new contracts in place within the next 12 to 18 months. Um, we do believe that we would be proposing a, an extension to the Southern California Gas Company. That will be coming before our board of public works this month and then eventually to your council sometime in late October, early November. With that said, I'm gonna transfer it back to our president to uh, do any closing comments and then we can take any questions that you may have. Thank you. No closing comments other than um, any questions uh, that you all have for any of the three of us. Sure, and, and as I mentioned before, we could probably fill five meetings with questions on all the topics that you've outlined. So I'll start asking one or two and we can each ask a couple questions, but we won't, uh, we won't exhaustively go through your list because Basically, it's everything, it under, the, everything so. under the sun, and we're, <laughs> we're thrilled that you have all these great priorities, and there's, there's so many good things uh, happening. Uh, and start with the, uh, your very first goal, which is the, the street trimming, uh, street tree trimming. Okay. And I'll, I'll throw a very sort of generic question out there about street, about street trees, which is, um, and we all share that, that goal, which is whose responsibility is it? Because this... It may seem like a simple question, but as you know, it's a little more complex. Ever that simple. Um, but I get, I get asked this question all the time from constituents, and I thought I'd go to great, right to the source in terms of um, what we should, how we should answer that question when it comes to our street trees. On who should trim them? Who should trim them? Well, who's it, it's more than just trimming. It's the response, like whose responsibility is it? Because it, because it's complicated because we trim them. Yes. But the public is liable to some extent when somebody trips and falls. Uh, at the same time, it's, someone has to get a permit in order to cut the tree down, but it's in their right of way. Uh, so it's, it's not, a, it's not it, I've never found it to be a simple answer, and so I thought I'd throw it out there since it's, it, is a, it is one of the top priorities, it's your top priority. Is, or it is, you know, and I, I, when I talk about tree trimming, being a priority, I, I think it's the city's responsibility. Now, look, the council can shift that responsibility to the public if that's something that the that the council um, uh, and the people they represent desires. Uh, but as our understanding now, certainly mine, is it's the city's responsibility to trim the trees that are in the city right of way. Um, and the it gets complicated sometimes when um, there are issues about trees on. Uh, private property that may hang over into uh, the public right-of-way. Then you get into some liability issues. We always have liability issues that I will defer to the city attorney on when we have issues that relate in, um, uh, in, in harm or damage to property or, or more importantly, of course, uh, harm to individuals. Um, that does open the door for me to mention that uh, another priority of ours, particularly this year, um, is looking at our uh, risk management process in the Department of Public Works. Um, it is, um, uh, I think, it's a huge mistake uh, to spend money paying lawsuits uh, when, when that money could go towards services. Never mind the fact that if we put the money towards services, we're able to protect our residents from being injured. Um, so We've talked about this a lot. It pains me in budget committee, all the payouts that we do. Yeah, and so that is, 
um, uh, that's an element of um, uh, all of our priorities. I mean, we have, uh, and there are, there are a number of elements of that. The trees relate, to, that goes with tree trimming, it goes with sidewalk repair, and it goes with pavement preservation because you can have large asphalt repairs that relate to that. But it's our position, and it always has been in the time that I've been here, that for tree trimming in the, in the public right-of-way, that's the, the city's responsibility. Um, and, you know, there, there may be a desire because of the backlog, because of what happened in the Great Recession, to have a discussion, even, you know, and it may be something that some property owners would prefer to take on themselves, the responsibility of trimming the trees in their own parkway. Um, right now, maintaining the parkway is the responsibility of the homeowner. Um, so, um, you know, but trimming the trees remains of, the responsibility. Of the homeowner, uh, of the... Adjacent, I should say, the adjacent property owner. Right. And, and that gets more complicated as we do the fix and release program for... Exactly. ...sidewalks. Exactly. Does that change the dynamic with the streets, with the street trees at all as we start to turn over and individuals take responsibility for their sidewalks? I don't think it does. Um, once someone... Uh, it repairs the sidewalks and the responsibility is released back to the adjacent property owner for the sidewalk, um, I would expect that the responsibility to trim the trees remains with the city. Okay. Um, the Public Works Trust Fund, we were talking about that. Has there been any issues with getting it paid back? And is that is that something we should be worried about or thinking about? I Let know we, me, we talked about the, the what the great work you're doing, which is separate and apart from the great work of freeing up or maybe it's not separate, it's related, I guess, to freeing up the, the other dollars that are in that trust fund. So let me um, start by saying, and I would just mention that recently um, uh, regarding um, a, a project um, that in the city that the Public Works Trust Fund, those funds um, that, uh, that a Nexus study demonstrate uh, are paid in for a council office, those are the council office's funds. They're, are not our funds. What we need to do to meet the legal threshold to return those funds to the council office um, is uh, the Nexus study that is underway now that you provided the budget money for. On the Public Works Trust Fund, um, let me say, first of all, as, as uh, Dr. Campos mentioned a moment ago, um, the, when we came on board, um, the Public Works Trust Fund needed a lot of work. Um, and um, your colleague uh, uh, and my former colleague, uh, then Commissioner Rodriguez, um, and myself and um, uh, Matt Zabo, uh, as officers of the Board of Public Works, that was a, a priority of ours with the executive officer that we hired. Um, Dr. Campos has done a terrific job on it. The answer is, uh, regarding loaned funds from the Public Works Trust Fund, um, we are shored up, he has the, the statistics in his head, but our um, uh, repayment rate is uh, vastly uh, uh, more significant than it was when we started four years ago. Um, we are able to loan money again, and we have been. It's been a popular trust fund from which to borrow, and but just to, so the record's clear, we loan money to the Public Works Trust Fund. Most often it's to front fund grants. Um, we're able to loan money once we know that there is um, a repayment source. Um, and so uh, we've been calling back those grant funds um, as often as we can. We've gone, uh, maybe the CAO would argue, a little overboard in, um, in trying to call back other loan monies uh, because there are documents that don't allow us to call those monies back yet, but we've tried to get some down payments. Um, but we are, for the first time in a few years, um, meeting the, um, the requirements of the documents related to the loaned funds. That said, uh, it is a popular fund for, uh, for loaning. And Fernando, what are we, are we at the, are we at the cusp of the money that we can loan right now? We're at the ceiling, you think? We're 29% at a 30%, yeah, at a 30% threshold. Now, the council can decide, um, well, the board could decide upon council approval, we could increase that threshold if we wanted to. Is that good governance? That's another question. And if we decide we want to increase the, the, the loan threshold, that's a discussion that could be had then. But currently it's at 30% and, and that's where the threshold is. And we're right at about 29% now. Yep. 
Dr. Campbell. The only thing I would add to that is that we do have overall about $124 million in our public works trust fund. The $12 million in the Nexus study only debottlenecks about 12. The other areas that we've been looking at is our B permits. This is that $36 million number that I threw out earlier. Is the what? $36 million and B permits, so builder's permits. We also are looking at other accounts such as our U permits, excavation permits. We're looking at our tree trimming, uh, I'm sorry, tree services accounts. So those accounts may have a couple more million dollars that we can start debottlenecking. However, we have set a priority in terms of where we start our focus on. Eight out of our 28 accounts have about 80% of the balance there. So we are now number four, peeling the onion on number five. So our goal is to start looking at all these accounts one by one, wherever there is a um, maximum return on our investment. So with your council, you approved a position that was authorized about two years ago, and that's what we got the $36 million in return. Next year, we are looking at possibly proposing new resources that will debottleneck another two or $3 million. So we're currently working on that concept, and eventually it'll hit, uh, come before your uh, council to consider. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And before we further to, we drift off too much from tree trimming, I just wanted to go back and couple, ask a couple of questions on that. Um, our current tree trimming services, I know for on-demand, it's our city employees, and for um, you know scheduled tree trimming, it's contracted out. That's correct. And do we do that because like, is it more cheaper or? Well, oh boy, you <laughs> we had this discussion this morning. Let me, I'll I'll try and keep this uh, brief. Uh, in the Great Recession, um, uh, the Urban Forestry Division was, uh, I'll describe it my term, decimated. Um, what, 60% down, 70% down, Nazario? Um, so you're operating at 30 or 40% of what was there before. To get any work done, um, because the crews weren't there to do it, it had to be contracted out. In our first year on the Board of Public Works, we noticed, because we didn't have any crews to do tree trimming, uh, we noticed that the bids that were coming in were shockingly beyond the city's estimate. And that was when we came that first budget year um, to ask for one crew, because we knew if we had one city crew, because the market knew that we didn't have any, any crews either, so they knew they could, they could you know, increase the prices on us. So we knew if we got one crew in the budget, which we did, and thank you for that, that the bids would stabilize, and they stabilized to a degree but not where they should be. The market still knows that we are low. The problem with um, the, what we've seen with contract tree trimming, some contractors obviously, it's like that with any industry, some contractors are better than others. I remember a budget hearing where a councilman said, if you read the Yelp review on this tree trimmer, well, the, unfortunately for us, the Yelp review is irrelevant. It's the lowest responsive responsible bidder. And so uh, when we have our own city crews, we can send them where we need to send them, when we need to send them, and importantly, where you need them sent, when you need them sent. If we, if we have a contract tree trimmer to do that, I've got to modify the contract. If the contractor doesn't want to do that, then we have a problem. Same with, with the quality of the work. Many of our tree trimming contractors do good work, but we've had a wide array of experience, shall we say. And if we go back to the contractor and say you didn't trim that tree to spec, they can say, yes, we did. No, we didn't. Yes, we did. We end up in a lawsuit to solve that. If we've got a, a city crew, we can just send our own crew back out. So where we would like to get, and when I talk about rebuilding urban forestry, it is, uh, it, it, it's, this is not a task that is a temporary task yeah. that is better fit for contracting. It is a permanent task, particularly when you look at our backlog. And that permanent task, I think, warrants um, the restoration of the urban forestry division. Thank you, Mr. President. Actually, that's exactly where I wanted to go to. And just in the interest of time, I'll just condense my um, uh, questions into a, a, a comment. I mean, like we have an item, you know, uh, that was introduced by Englander and seconded by uh, by yourself, Mr. Chair. I think it's about time that we look into um, having more um, city tree trimmers and having more city crews because, I mean, we've been on the phone many times. I mean, I, I'm fortunate enough to have a lot of a lot of trees uh, in the city in my district. But you know, sometimes we have um, contractors who um, go overzealous and over trim or take out, I mean, it's hard enough to get dead trees removed, but once in a while they go on a rampage and remove too many dead trees or um, uh, partially dead trees. Um, and you know, and the, the rates uh, continually go up. Um, I know we were quoted one 
uh, one year, and they couldn't finish it all in one year, so it went on to the next year, but then there was uh, a cost of uh, uh, COLA increases and all of that, so actually the budget didn't go far enough, and I had to augment it with my discretionary funds just to promise the community, I mean, to deliver on what was promised to the community the year before. So there's been so much um, fluctuations with these contractors, and it seems like they are taking advantage of us, and if it was clear-cut cost savings and there were all these other benefits to it, it'd be another story, but I think it's time that we have some more city crews. And, and just, just another, well, look, this has been a very trying month for our nation with two hurricanes and what happened in yeah. Las Vegas, but talk about the hurricanes for a moment. Um, and we, we had just this year with our own rainy season, it is very expensive, Councilman, as you know, if, we've got an, if I've got to go get a contractor to remove down trees, that's going to get very expensive because they know that it's an emergency and they know they can charge us more and they know that's not what their contract is for. Having city crews to do that, they're available, they're able, they're ready, they're on call or they're on duty and we can get that done. That's just another added benefit. Right, because right now, and I know there's a concern about um, having more uh, potential um, uh, future liabilities, but what's our cycle? How many years does it require to trim all uh, our trees? It depends on how you calculate it. And 70 years or something to. like that? Some stories will say 70 years, but I always say if we're, you know, we can reduce that in one area by putting a crew out there. So, um, you know, in, it's, it's longer than it should be. Yeah, um, so. But uh, you can say it's anywhere from 10 to 50 years. That's all on that. Dramatic. It's Martinez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I had a question about uh, the permitting process. How are we managing the permitting um, request for sidewalks, tree trimming, and pruning? How are we expediting those? What's the timeline before someone can get a permit to actually do their own work? To do their own work? Uh, Ms. Royal, on tree trimming? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, sidewalks, tree trimming, and pruning? Oh, our tree guy's right here. Chief Forrester, Tim Tyson. Good question. Council Hi, members. Trent. Hi. Um, could talk about trees forever, uh, but the question relates to how long does it take from once someone puts in for the sidewalk repair program? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's up right about three months once they put in for the rebate because there has to be all the, uh, uh, they need to have all these documents that they have to send in to qualify we do the inspections, the sidewalk people and the tree people, and then BOE and uh, UFD get together with the permitting process. But it, it, it can be very uh, difficult with uh, historic preservation overlay zones in different areas in the city that create a longer time needed. We're trying to work on a uh, better way of making it happen faster. But it's, it's about three months. So is it a lack of uh, personnel um, in your department to approve um, all these permits? Because the biggest complaint I get from folks who want to do their own work is that it takes an enormous long amount of time to actually get a final approval. So is the lack of personnel in your department to be able to review and approve? And at the board level, what are you doing to streamline the process so that we can get this stuff expedited? I mean, if people are willing to do their own work, I don't see why we're yeah. Adding I think an your, your questions are, are we're very obviously not getting to, to we're not getting to it, so they're going to go ahead and take it upon themselves to do the job. So I get all the preservation conversations that need to take place, but at the same time, we cannot possibly make it that difficult um, for people to do their own work if they're going to pay out of pocket. Does yeah, that make I, sense? I think that's an excellent question, but I would like to defer those questions to the uh, program administrator, which is the Bureau of Engineering. I They're really don't want to don't want to respond on their behalf, because I know they got very good answers, and I don't want to give uh, give you the wrong answer, Councilwoman. Mr. James, do you have anything to add in terms of what the board could be doing to streamline some of these permitting the permitting process? So. One of the things that we've discovered, um, and you're, you're talking about tree removals related to sidewalk repair, um, we have looked at a, a number of, uh, of different ways to streamline the process for the very reason that you state uh, the community is willing to engage and spend their own money. We ought to make it as easy as possible. Right. Um, and one of the things I've learned that, that while that makes uh, perfect sense and it does on its face, whenever you're dealing with trees, it's much more complicated than it should be. 
um, we run into a number of things regarding, um, uh, even though it's uh, someone's sidewalk that they want um, uh, repaired, um, and the tree may be in their parkway, uh, trees are uh, thought to be community items. Um, and we end up needing, because of the environmental, the interests of the environmental community, which we understand, the interests of preserving our urban tree canopy, which we understand, the Community Forest Advisory Committee and their interest, um, we end up with a lot of people at the table with a sincere interest in tree canopy, and once a tree is gone, it's gone. Um, and so, uh, the um, other than what works mathematically, if we, if and I don't, I don't always like to say that this is the answer because I don't think it should be, but if we have more staff, then we can get more permits done faster. Other attempts that we have made, um, and where we would like to. Um, look at some new options and uh, is what technology can do for us. Um, and we're, as I mentioned earlier, we're looking at what other cities are doing. But right now with all of the stakeholders at the table, it has proven very difficult to make the tree removal process as smooth as it should be. And it really is amazing sometimes what we hear um, in our board hearings on uh, proposed tree removals for trees that are essentially dead trees that could be harmful. Someone loves that tree, and it just causes all kinds of um, of additional uh, considerations that need to take place. Thank so, you for that. Thank you but for the honesty. <laughs> I, I, I hear I, I hear I know you. you do. Uh, my other question has to do with Mr. Chair in terms of how are the department handling the prevailing wage when it comes to graffiti removal. I'm not sure if you know that the state I'm, passed a well, law, you're all aware of it, that we now have to pay prevailing wage. And some of our nonprofits are having a real hard time trying to uh, manage administrative costs um, and actually deliver on, on providing services. Do we have any idea what is the plan in order for us to deal with that prevailing wage issue when it comes to the con graffiti contracts that we currently hold? We do. We've been working on it uh, this year for it's well. It's we've been working on it for longer than this year, but yeah, it's it's, it's ripe now. Yeah. Um, it will. Um, you will hear much more about it um, uh, as we talk about our budget proposals. But Fernando Campos is prepared to talk about that today on the operational side um, and give you whatever detail you need. We've got it broken down to numbers. Yeah, what are we doing to ensure that we don't lose or reduce our actual service um, provision? That's the that's the that's my bottom line. Excellent question. We have been wrestling with this question for the last two years since we were notified about the prevailing wage issue. And our goal is to co be fully compliant with the prevailing wage laws. We are now vetting out different scenarios that we are considering internally in terms of what we propose before your council. Our goal is to maintain service levels the way they are now. What that means is that there could be a segment of the population in our community-based organizations that may have to uh, be paid a little bit more to meet that prevailing wage. These are individuals that are out in the field, individuals that are supervising field workers that are actually doing paint-related work. So anyone that's actually touching the paint or abating the, uh, the graffiti, those would be the individuals that would be impacted. Individuals that are providing clerical support staff, project coordination, assistance, the inventory, those individuals will not be impacted by the prevailing wage. So. Two years ago, we thought it would be the entire contract in which that prevailing wage would be um, impacted. At that time, we didn't have the resources or even the, uh, the know-how to how go about attacking this problem. Now we have a little bit more information. So long story, we are working on that. We are looking at different proposals that we will be submitting to the mayor's office to then propose to so the council. So that's you're going to submit a plan to the mayor's office? Ultimately, we want to remain partners with our community-based okay. organizations, remain the, the service levels, keep the crews, keep folks employed. We want to make sure that there's a no net job loss at the end of the okay, day. Okay, so you, there is a plan. One, one additional element. Um, there, you know, there's an exemption for Conservation Corps. And so, but I was wondering, I'm glad you mentioned the exemption part because I was also wondering if there was an attempt to exempt contractors from this requirement, not just a conservation corps. Um, th those have failed, um, the, at least the ones that, that I've heard about. And the, the conservation corps exemption is written, it's not just LA Conservation Corps, it's statewide, as right. you know. 
for California Conservation Corps. Our concern is we really don't want to be have to move all the work over there because that's unfair uh, to all, all those other, other people providers. That are, losing, right. that are losing that work. Um, our uh, inquiries about other possible exemptions have not proven fruitful at all. Okay. And that's why we've been forced to these other options. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and my last question, Mr. Chair, has to do with how is Public Works incorporating the equity and social justice into their work? So uh, living wage, local hire, re-entry jobs is all great and we should continue to do that. But how are we incorporating the equity and the social justice into the actual delivery of infrastructure, maintenance, and improvements? Um, so, for example, when we focus on resurfacing a street, uh, is it based on miles of, uh, of uh, is it based on a matrix or calculations, or are you actually looking at disadvantaged communities that don't have an infrastructure, and should we be taking those up first because they lack the basic needs to get around? Does that make sense? Yes. Sure. So I think that um, there's a lot more that we can all be doing in this regard. And I think that um, data is really the way that we're going to get there. And I think we've shown that with the, the Clean Streets program that actually using data and attaching hard numbers, giving uh, different uh, parts of our city a grade in terms of need, um, outlines a clear pathway for where we should be prioritizing service delivery. So I want to give you an example. For example, Moorhart Avenue in Sun Valley is a failed street. It's been documented, I don't know how many times over. But that street, for example, lacks curbs and gutters. It lacks um, storm drains. When it rains, for example, this past um, winter, it flooded like it always does. So the Bureau will tell you that they can't resurface that street because they don't have the basic infrastructure. So it's going to fail. It's going to continue to erode and fail. But those, that's an example of a failed street that has not been prioritized because we don't have the basic infrastructure to support the rest of that neighborhood. So that's just an example of a disadvantaged community, a community who's dealing with enviro environmental justice issues for decades. And we haven't prioritized those communities because we continue to do things I don't know how you're looking at in terms of providing the basics, but I think equity and social justice needs to come into the into your uh, strategy or your proposal in how, what communities get what infrastructure improvements because it's not happening in that way. That's something that, um, Councilwoman, we may be able to do with additional funding from Measure M to deal with some of the, the failed streets. What, before um, the passage of Measure M, as I call it, um, the economics of street paving. Uh, the road that you talked about, if it's a, if it's a failed street, let's say it's a, it's roughly if a failed street means it's a, basically a million dollars or plus per mile to repair. We have a, we've always had a fixed amount of funding for pavement preservation. If we take that million dollars to repair that mile, no matter where it is, we don't have that million dollars for 40 miles of slurry seal, which enables us to maintain the integrity of the other streets, the A, Bs, and Cs, that you don't want to ever fall to the DNF because of the exponential increase in the cost of repairing. What that has meant is, for the past several years, because we have not had this increase in funding for street services, it's just been able to maintain the pavement condition index. We haven't been able to touch D streets, F streets, or concrete streets, no matter where they are. With Measure M funds, we now have a, the opportunity for a whole new equation that can take those equity issues into account. On another aspect uh, of, uh, the, uh, of street maintenance, in a way, we'll talk about street cleanliness. If you look at the data related to street sweeping, with street sweeping, if you look at the, uh, the way that the routes, the posted routes are broken up in the city, those are the ones that get sweeping every single week. Those routes are more heavily concentrated, and they have been for several years, in South LA and in the Harbor area versus um, other areas, uh, including in the valley, uh, parts of the valley and parts of West LA. Um, that's an area where the, uh, if you look at the disadvantaged communities, lower income communities, you're going to see more significant service for street sweeping than other parts of the city. Um, 
whether the, the controller is working on an audit right now. Uh, we've been in communication with them about it, of course. What their proposals are going to be uh, regarding that are still remain to be seen. Um, but the ability to take equity into that consideration, I think, is going to be part of the controller's report as well. The, the posted routes in the city of Los Angeles, though, they were chosen by various communities. And the complications that happen is when you go back to neighborhoods and say that we would like to sweep your street once a week, that's great until you tell them that they're going to lose parking mm -hmm. for two hours a week. So there's that constant balance. One of the things I talked about earlier with our priorities is what technology will be able to do for us. Uh, but back to your original question on street paving and dealing with the D's and F's, we have not had the money at all to consider that one way or the other. The LA Times, of course, did a study that was published, I think, maybe December of last year, looking at street paving and dividing which council districts had a better pavement condition index versus other council districts and which communities were stronger than others. It was an interesting read, of course, but we can't do much about that unless we have money beyond what it takes to keep the, uh, the pavement condition index stable. So, I mean, I certainly understand and, and why what, Bureau, Bureau, Bureau of Street Services has concerns, but it's really frustrating um, to not have a broader commitment from Public Works on how we approach this overall. That you have entire neighborhoods that were annexed into the city without, with, with the lack of infrastructure or no infrastructure at all. And these neighborhoods, just like everyone else, pays taxes. And so they deserve to have the basic infrastructure to be able to go in and repave their streets. So I just think there needs to be a different type of way to look at it and strategize in terms of how we deliver on infrastructure for the entire city based on, on where the real need is at. I agree with you. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. That's it. Great. Thank you, Mr. Buscano. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you um, for your report, Mr. President and Vice President. Um, thanks for your leadership to um, Dr. Campos and all the uh, Bureau family who's here, appreciate your work. And, you know, hearing those sirens moments ago reminds me of the work that you do. Uh, if it wasn't for the work that you do and all the, the men and women of the Bureau, that fire truck wouldn't be able to get to that emergency call that they need to, to get to. So I appreciate the work that you do and we value the Bureau. Um, and with that comes some challenges, including what Ms. Martinez just indicated on, and I have a number of streets in Wilmington, similarly, that too don't have sidewalks in um, heavy industrial area, EJ community. And it was important for me to raise the issue on local return dollars on um, the Measure M, and Measure which, M, sure. which I did. And I, I, thankfully, our mayor supported um, a higher re local return dollars so that we can fix our streets and, and build out uh, the infrastructure needed, including sidewalks, and more importantly, having SB1 passed in the state legislature to, uh, it's gonna see some improvements in our road conditions moving forward. I should, and I neglected to mention those dollars as well, uh, Councilwoman Martinez, they give us the opportunity to address those, uh, those equity issues head on. Yep. Go ahead, sir, sorry. With that, um, I, I still feel that the Bureau needs to do a better job in communicating, coordinating when we see a project that has a number of departments that are associated with the, for example, we, in, in my neighborhood, there is a street um, uh, pavement project on, on a trash pickup day. So at a time where, you know, we city uh, street services posted no parking, um, on a trash day and the residents were just confused. They put the trash out. Uh, next thing you know, you got the, uh, the sanitation truck coming down during the, uh, the, street, uh, the street project and it was all hell in a handbasket. So let me ask you, when a project requires um, work from more than one bureau, what systems are in place to encourage more collaboration, communication, and, um, to see through the completion of the project? and? Do you feel improvements are needed? Oh, absolutely. Keep in mind, uh, look, this is something that we will uh, continue to um, struggle with um, for the time being until we are fully equipped technologically on our ability to coordinate with all of the other agencies that we have to deal with not only within public works, within our public works bureaus, within one department. The trash example you give, that's the easiest one for us to solve. 
because it's just another bureau within the Department of Public Works. That should never happen. Um, and I, fortunately, I don't think it happens, it may happen more than I know, um, depending on what happens in your district, but that's not one I hear much about. Um, what happens more significantly that you're very well aware of, Councilman, is we, the Bureau of Street Services coordinates, uh, and, and Bureau of Engineering as well, with so many utility and telecom companies, I don't even know how they come up with a number. I mean, it's over 100 of them. Um, and when you look at the coordination and the planning that goes on, it's well in a year in advance. Um, so there's certainly the time to, to meet those coordination requirements, but the, and this is not by way of excuse, it's by way of fact, the, the infrastructure, the field on which we play is so vast and so large um, that it is really uh, hard to be perfect. That said, there's a lot of room for improvement, and I think that the best opportunity that we have for improvement is going to be technology. And with technology, I, I think it's, it's money that's well spent. It's not a whole lot of budget money in the grand scheme of our budget. The amount of data that we're pulling now from our street sweepers, from putting the, um, the Axoft technology and the GPS on our street sweepers, that was not an expensive venture. Um, and there, you know, there are other elements of technology that are going to benefit us in coordinating with other bureaus, with other departments, that especially on the grand scheme of things, um, just is not going to cost a lot of money. Um, but I, I, can, I can attest to also, I've, I've noticed that there's better collaboration with uh, DOT and street services. Uh, case in point, recent, recently a street was paved, and within a matter of a few days, um, compared to five years ago, it was actually yes. a couple of weeks, we're say, starting to yeah. see the, the streets being striped uh, accordingly. We've worked uh, particularly hard on that issue. Yeah. It, was, it was at crisis levels, you remember, five years ago. Um, and we focus first on schools, of course, yep, yep. and continue to. And if I can, Mr. Chairman, my last question is on um, Clean Streets LA. Um, I introduced a motion partnership with um, our chairman here, highlighting the pervasiveness of trash in our in our city. Um, that w we've done a great job with Clean, L um, Clean Streets LA, but we're talking here in the daily trash issue. Um, daily litter maintenance is still a big uh, area of concern. Um, can you speak to the efforts to keep our streets clean outside of just Clean Streets LA? Um, sure. Well, I think we have, uh, through our Office of Community Beautification, um, we have some contracts that go beyond graffiti um, in some districts. Usually it's because you guys kind of choose to support that. But everything that's proactive um, really is happening through the Clean Streets program. Um, you know, sanitation for a long time was operating on a premise that success was simply servicing your routes. And so with, with your work, we helped change that to success is actually keeping neighborhoods clean. Um, and so one of the things that we've done on litter is that we've put, uh, we've put out an additional, um, fifth, uh, it, we're now up to 2,500 new uh, ALBs, trash cans. Actually, I've been noticing a lot of them, the tops are popping off. So you know, when you add something, you start to see how you end up with problems that you then have to go and solve. But um, I think that it's, it's a matter of continuing to work towards um, additional services, additional proactive services, additional funding for our, our beautification contractors to go out and handle the light litter and the, the weed abatement that it doesn't make sense for our city crews to do that you know, they're, they're nimble, they're more easily ab able to handle that light work. So I think we have more to do. I do think that our franchise, um, once we get everything up and running, is going to offer us another opportunity on that front yeah. um, and looking at how we're using the franchise fees, um, how we're using the community benefits dollars. Um, those will be partners in those areas, so we're not, we won't be in a position any longer where there's, you know, 40-something trash companies operating, but it's really the city and one other company. So how do we partner with them on neighborhood cleanliness as well? I'm looking forward to that discussion. I raised the issue um, when that contract came before us. The concerns I had when we're, we're raising um, the trash collection fees, yet we're not making any promises on cleaning our streets and keeping our streets clean. But I understand 
told us a policy decision and looking forward to having that policy discussion and uh, really uh, leveraging those those franchise fees to keep our, our streets clean. Can I add something to Councilman to, to your question? Um, in addition to what the Bureau of Sanitation is doing, uh, one of the uh, the elements that we're looking at with street sweeping is street cleanliness. Um, and you know what what uh, uh, we, we one piece of technology that we still lack that we would like to get is the ability to measure um, the amount of debris that a street sweeper is picking up um, and getting a sense of when it's filling up, you know, what, and, and get a sense through metrics and through data, what streets need sweeping the most. Because if we get a sense of that, we, we, we will discover very likely that some, we may be sweeping, I'm sure we're gonna find out, we're sweeping some clean streets. When other streets, that are right. not clean are not getting swept. And so the, uh, you know, we're gonna want to be able to move our machinery from point A to point B in those instances. But to do it, it's best to have the data because as it showed with clean streets, when you got that data, you can much more efficiently and effectively move your resources to get the most out of them. Yep. And that's something that we will be asking for with street sweeping and that we expect to see um, a robust study and discussion on in connection with the controller's audit. Appreciate that. And let's remind ourselves that, you know, the broken windows theory, if we're oh, not absolutely. cleaning our streets, cleaning our streets. One piece of litter begets right. another, sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Ms. Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and to my former colleagues, thank you very much for a very broad, you know, a lot of this stuff is just kind of a, a refresher on much of what I was engaged in uh, in my previous role. But what I was delighted to hear um, and most concerned about, and you recall my work with so many of our uh, OCB contractors and the important work that they provide. Um, but we are all very familiar, and for those of us, because of term limits and whatnot in history, before the economic downturn, they did have a much more expansive role in helping to support the cleanliness of our streets. Um, helping to assure that they remain a part of that I think is very important because many of the individuals that are employed with uh, our community, uh, many of our contractors through the Office of Community Beautification are the very stakeholders and, and residents sure. that have a vested interest to assure the cleanliness of our streets. But more importantly, just because of the need for us to make maximum and highest best use of the tax dollars that we do have. I know Council Member Martinez and a number of us, uh, you know, I, myself included, also have on staff strike teams where we are hired, we've hired additional staff just to go out and manage bulky items that were perhaps missed or come online um, because of the need for a more immediate response. And again, it's, it's just part of when you consider and take into context all that we have to deal with in the area of homeless encampments and requiring uh, the more specialized uh, staffing levels from the Bureau of Sanitation. I just want to make sure that we are being very thoughtful about the conversation as it relates to the prevailing wage issue because I would hate for that to affect us in such a way that we would not be able to provide the same level of services as it relates to all of these issues because they're all connected. That's our number one goal, Councilwoman, Good to know. is making sure that we keep that service level the same. And they have proven, let me just pile on a little bit on your point regarding the partnership with these OCB contractors, as you know. They have really helped kind of pick up the slack um, in so many different ways and they've, we've been able to go to them on clean streets, on sidewalk repair, on a number of things. We've got Mr. Roch here in case you all had some more detailed questions that, that we couldn't answer because you know how he is running the department. But, um, but that is our number one priority with prevailing wage and we're also very interested in what they can do uh, complementing us going forward. Thank you. Great, thank you. And uh, I know I've got a million other questions, but we're, I'm also conscious of the time, and, and I know my colleagues have as well. So, Mr. James, th thank you very much. Mr. Penning, uh, Dr. Campos, this is a great, great uh, update for us on, on a whole variety of issues, and we're going to be working with you throughout the year on, on all of them. So thank you very much. We look forward to them. Thank you. Great, thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it, thank you all. And thank you to your staff as well. Absolutely, thank you. Um, item five, we were originally gonna take it up, but I think in, in a 
talking to my colleagues, I think questions have been answered on that. So if there's no objection, I'd like to take item five on consent as well. And seeing, seeing no objection, uh, item five is approved on consent, which brings us to our remaining item. Um, Mr. Chairman, would you read item four to the record, please? And Mr. Chair, just to clarify, item one did have did not have recommendation. Thank you. It was discussion only item, so there's no no uh, no action uh, needed, no vote needed by this council on item one. Thank item you. number four is a, a report from the Bureau of Street Services in response to the motion from council members Englander and Bloomfield relative to the estimated cost for bureau employees to maintain landscape median islands in the West Valley area. Good afternoon, Stephanie Clements from Bureau of Street Services. So as you just mentioned, we were asked to provide an estimated cost on performing the maintenance of landscape medians in the West Valley, looking at the cost if we contract it out versus if we pull it in-house and use city forces. So first I wanted just to review the contract cost. So the actual contract itself is for $798,000. However, there are city staff that are required to support the contract, to provide contract uh, uh, quality assurance, to ensure that the um, contractor is performing per contract terms and conditions. There's staff that are needed to pay invoices and resolve, you know, reconcile invoice issues and things like that. So it, there is a city cost associated with contracts, and we're estimating that to be about 136000 So the total cost of the contracted amount is about 933000 So then we, what we did was we estimated if we were to take this service in-house. And so we estimated that it would require about four crews at a um, cost of about $1.27 And that's only direct costs. So the differential between those two amounts is about 336000 So. Um, as mentioned, that does not include fringe benefits. If we did add fringe benefits in there, the differential would be even higher. Um, but that said, as, as mentioned previously, there are advantages to bringing these types of services in-house, and we're always willing to support a pilot program. We could look at a smaller portion of the West Valley area and have city forces do the work. We would, of course, need uh, staffing and funding for that. So I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Great, thanks. And, and I assume some of the same issues that we talked about in terms of the street trees uh, are true as well, which is having an in-house force, uh, even though according to the, to the information is more expensive, but could help keep the competition down on the on the medians, on the, on the outsource group. Is that true? Yeah, I mean, there's advantages. There's, um, you know, we're, we're not motivated by profit, whereas a contractor is motivated by profit. Um, we have more ability to be more flexible if certain events come up and we need to pull people off of this area and, and help them with events. So there are definitely advantages to doing it in-house, but looking at this particular item, it is more expensive. So, and, and help me understand on this item, the, the bid for the median maintenance came in more than $300,000 above the estimate. Correct. How does that compare to other contracts throughout the city? Um, well, we for, for um, landscape medians, we have only one other contractor. So I believe it was fairly similar. And what I was told is that we may have just underestimated what the actual work would cost in the marketplace. And what was the, when was the last time that the city crews were actually responsible for scheduled maintenance of medians? It's been quite some time, council members. Um, as you well know, last year we had the woods contractor who uh, didn't complete the contract. And that really uh, was sad for all the constituents in the city. We did our best to uh, make good, but this is one way to make sure those kind of things don't happen any longer. So it's been back when uh, Urban Forestry Division had 85 souls which was about 2009 or 10 when everything went backwards. So we've been slowly rebuilding, and this is another chance to rebuild, bring in forces on board. Yeah, I think you'll find a lot of sympathy for that in this group for sure. And, and not only was it sad when that happened, I mean, for me, the pitchforks in my community were out and the torches were lit. It was not, uh, it was not a pleasant thing with, the, with those medians being out. Um, uh, re regarding the medians, though, another question. So thank you. Uh, 
the contractor is usually not responsible for maintaining the irrigation system. Is that right? And does this continue to be the case for Mariposa? Does Bureau of Street Services have money in their budget to maintain the irrigation systems? Because obviously, uh, you know, when, when, when that happens and there's not enough water and everything dies out. Absolutely. Uh, they have minimum responsibility to the irrigation systems. So they have what? They have minimum responsibility for the irrigation systems. Right. Uh, sprinkler heads, things like that, they, they fix. Uh, if an irrigation line breaks under the ground, uh, we usually go out and dig them up and fix those. But as far as the heads and things like that, they fix those things that are just on the surface. So does the Bureau have the money to fix them when the irrigation system goes out? We do when it's one that uh, is, is, you know, has resources for it. That median island needs to be irrigated. We have islands that just have trees and they don't get irrigated. There's just certain islands that have turf. Well, I'll put an example. There's a median in my district on Sherman Way, um, and unfortunately, the irrigation went out, and we had invested a lot of money in not just the city, but also my office in plants along that. Uh, the irrigation went out, everything died in the medians. And, um, you know, and so now I know there's a, there's a plan for medians, you know, are we going to replace what was, what was basically died off there, or how does that work? We're, we're trying to replace uh, ground cover where it's died off. Uh, however, there's a lot of old irrigated uh, systems out there and panels that have not been fixed for a long, long time. Bringing on this type of support is where we could start getting in to where the resources aren't for and have our own people try to fix up some of these uh, panels and, and, and project ourselves forward where it's not being fixed. That's why we need the resources and the and, the and so, so would we hire people just for medians? Is that something that we would do? Well, this is this is for landscape median islands. It's for a project to try to get uh, hire the people that uh, we need to handle the West Valley uh, medians and also uh, hopefully start building the forces and be able to do more. As is talked about in here, uh, there's many other things that can be done with the staff on board. Ms. Rodriguez. Mr. Chair, I just wanted to um, reveal and uh, to and share that while I was on the Board of Public Works, I actually led a median design competition, and it has pre-approved templates that enable, through the Office of Community Beautification, if you do have local community organizations that want to sponsor it, I know they did it in CD4 in Franklin Hills, uh, they adopt the medians, and actually can, you know, that could be an interim solution at a much more cost-effective price point to help maintain it uh, for the time being. So that's always an option as well. Yeah, where, where you have a community that, that surrounds it and that's interested in it. That's So you can have works. one of the local, not, you know, one of the neighborhood organizations adopt the median through the Office of Community Beautification. And we have these pre-approved templates that were designed by UCLA. It was a competition that we did uh, about a year and a half ago or maybe two years ago now. So. Uh, but it basically allows uh, for the uh, the cover to uh, have them provide the services uh, there and, and maybe through a nonprofit organization adopt it. Uh, okay, uh, Ms. Martinez, go ahead. So, where, what are the specific locations for this motion? Is it... What are the specific locations? In terms of the uh, suggesting a pilot? That's right. Where you know, we, I don't we, see, the, I don't have the motion in front of me, but where exactly, what locations are they specifically asking for there to be a pilot? Well, that was actually our suggestion, um, but the motion refers to the entire West Valley area. Okay. And so we divide the city up into four quadrants. So it's one of the four quadrants. Okay, so, so in our the valley, suggestion the West, of a, it would be in the West Valley? Yes, correct. Um, and how long does it take to hire all the folks from the local hiring, target hiring program? How long is that going to take you? Well, we're, I mean, we're actually... Be um, able to be adopted in order it, to get the work done? Well, we would need the authorities, and once we get the authorities and the unfreeze through the CAO's office, local targeted hiring has actually been quicker than going through the normal civil service route. A little bit of a holdup is on the uh, backgrounds. That's been taking a while. We actually have six office trainees that are still pending background checks. Um, but I would guesstimate, you know, 
two to three months for local targeted hiring. Civil service may take a little bit longer. So is a current contractor, this contractor Mariposa, did they begin in July? Is this a contract, a new contract or a renewal? This is, this is a it's new a, contract. It's a new contract. So are we considering hiring from this program or are we using in-house services? How, is it, how does it work? So right now all of the four quadrants are contracted out. So that's, that's, how, already we were, in place. that's how we were proceeding this fiscal year. But okay. then this, with this motion, we're reporting back to kind of show you what the cost difference is between oh, okay. taking the work in-house versus contracting it out. Do you have a question? Okay. Also, um, what about safety issues and, and, and how this relates with the contractor versus us? For example, there's, it's actually in Ms. Martinez district, uh, in, on the west, in the West Valley as you, as you go into Balboa Park. Um, and I have some pictures to show you if you want, but uh, you know, when I drop my kids off there, the median is so overgrown that you can't see the oncoming traffic. And it's just a matter of time, what's that? It's very dangerous, and, and this is this is a park that you've got family. I mean, every every intersection is important, but this one you have tons of families going in to use the the park. How you know with these contracts, what what kind of um, accountability do we have for these safety issues, and what kind of liability does the uh, the contractor bear uh, for when the inevitable is going to happen in in that location? and others, but that one for sure, because it's a, and I, I can pass you the pictures, it's a terrible, um, it's a terrible view. You can't see as you turn in the park, the oncoming traffic, and people move pretty quick on Balboa. Well, on this one, I, we probably should be looking at it right away. Well, to, to can I, 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 I'm to, glad you brought this up, Mr. Yeah. Bloomfield, because this is, the, uh, this is a runaround that my office has received. So one, on the one part, the Office of Beautification won't do it because you're gonna have to close down two lanes in order to do the work. And the Bureau wants $10,000 in overtime to get it done. And, and so let's not beat around the bush I'm in this particular situation, I guess that's what we're doing. But, uh, I mean, so it's one or the other. We either close down two lanes of traffic to be able to get the work done or we pay the Bureau $10,000 worth of, of overtime. But that's basically the answer. I don't know what other explanation. That's the explanation my office has gotten but, but over this, and over but again. But this Mariposa is responsible for that median, correct? They should be. Yes. Right. Yes. So, so why does it have to cost it's extra? Right. As, as you're being told, it's cost. It's, it's costing an extra ten thousand dollars to do it on overtime because that's what they're going to need in order to finish the job. Is what I was told. But it should be part of theoretically right. part of the contract. That's why I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah. Yeah. So it, this is just an example, but it's it's. Obviously, we want an answer to the example, but it's also the broader question of, of safety and how these contracts work. Absolutely. Uh, last fiscal year, the Woods contractor walked off the contract, and we did everything we could to salvage. We went out to the outside hiring. We, we brought in extra people. We ran. Uh, I, I took tree surgeons. I took tree surgeon assistants and made them gardeners. We did as much as we could. Now, as far as liability goes, I believe that uh, the city is always liable for the for the median islands. Uh, as far as the contractor doing the work, I'm going to have to check and see why the one median island that I got a photo of today hasn't been serviced. Uh, as far as what Councilwoman uh, Mark, uh, Martinez is talking about, I'm not sure about that. That might have been something uh, her staff spoke with Hector Banuelos about, and I need to check on that. Yeah, we're, we're going to give you a call. I think my staff just reached out to get your number. Thank you. Mr. Roof. Uh, yes. Um, so I just wanted to ask, wait, but adopt the median program. One, I got two questions. Adopt the median program. Um, if a community adopts it, then they're on their own, right? They have, to pay for the, they have to pay for it on their own, right? So that's the thing. Yeah. No, but a lot of, there's been partnerships with the council offices to do that, to right. have some of the resources. You, you oftentimes do the discretionary funds right. anyways to do right. it. So the other question is, um, so this was a pilot project, or this was just a report back on, on how much it would cost. I mean, I understand it costs a little bit more, but I mean, all these horror stories that we have, I mean, I, there's, there, are there only three main contractors for the city divided up? Actually, right now, there's only two. Mariposa has three of the four co co uh, 
quadrants, and right. BMC has the fourth quadrant. Right, because I know in, in, in my area, for the fourth district, North Central, we had the contractor run off, but then when you guys RFP'd and got the new contractor, they got awarded, they came and looked at the job, and then they said, nah, forget it, we don't want to do it. And, and that was, I mean, talk about the pitchforks in the district. I mean, it just made us look so incompetent. So, I mean, how do we make this report into a reality? I mean, I'm... I mean, I'm ready to say, I know this was for the West Valley portion, but I want to include North and C North Central in there as well. Yeah, I mean, this is just a report on the numbers. Uh, ultimately, this is going to come to us in budget, and we're going to have to figure out a way, I think. Yeah, because the more this, our medians don't get serviced, I mean, not only is it a, a danger, but, you know, our sprinkler heads and uh, the system's getting uh, um, uh, dilapidated, it's, it's getting worn down. And for a crew to come in and take over, it, there's just so much more work to be done. So it's just, it, it's, it's, in, it's not even a cost savings, the, the, the little bit that's, that we could save by doing a contractor. And we, we have less control, like everybody is saying. Yeah, no, um, just, uh, and I, I want to thank you both. I, I know how challenging it is. I mean, we, we struggled with this, this even when I served on the Board of Public Works. Um, one of the reasons, just so you know, uh, Council Member Rue, I came up with the adopt a median program and helped to streamline that process for the permitting was because, uh, you know, we had a decimated crew that wasn't able to sustain the maintenance of our medians, and that wasn't going to be a viable excuse for us not having having these unsightly medians. The community wanted to be involved, wanted to create a uh, uh, a simpler process for them to help be a part of uh, doing drought tolerant options. Um, but again, it does come down to a budgetary issue, and the conversation is. Are we prepared to help assure that the Bureau of Street Services is going to have the staffing levels that it needs? And when we talk about uh, our, uh, our our pavement preservation program, when we talk about we're talking about a variety of different crews, when we talk about street tree crews, when we talk about everything, it all comes down to budget. And you know whether or not we are prepared to have that very uh, you know difficult conversation in the context of staffing levels to help restore the bureau back to the levels that it used to be at. And, you know, that's just one of the struggles that we have uh, in these conversations. But, um, you know, again, to the extent that we can also leverage some of the community uh, partners that we have and through the Office of Community Beautification, I think has always been a really good leverage for us to help balance all of those things until we can get our staffing levels back to the, you know, the, to the degree that we had prior to the economic downturn. Great. Great. Thank you. Did you have a comment? If I may. Councilman, um, this is an opportunity, as uh, Councilwoman Rodriguez has stated, for the city to invest in itself. We bring in a crew of our own. That way they can handle the maintenance of this area, as well as do many other things. That's the hope, and show that they actually can do way more than just this, as well as not be stuck with having one contractor do all the work in the city and then when they leave we're left with the ugliness that we had which was not nice and it, I received many many emails as well and we did our best to service everything we could and I think we did a good job for what resources we had had we had other resources within house we could have done much better I want to make another point. The contractors are required to maintain all the medians bi-weekly. So if there's an issue with medians not being maintained, we want to hear about it and we want to address it. That was me, so. Okay. Thank you both very much. Um, unless there's another question on this, we, we will, um, without objection, note and file. Oh, no, I'm sorry. We are not taking action on this yet. We have a public comment card. I apologize. Ms. Rhodes, uh, I've been waiting patiently please, and, and I have a feeling you probably uh, like the direction that we're all discussing. Yes, um, this has been a fabulous session, and I think everything integrates together really nicely. Um, I, I passed out a handout for you all, um, taking a look at the Mariposa contracts. Um, the first thing I want to flag it is that Mariposa is a repeat offender in terms of price gouging. Um, in 2014, the tree contracts, some of you remember, there were two LA Times stories because the price bidding was so astronomical. Um, and what we see here in the, in the blue box is 
that their bids came in close to 50% and then this, this West Valley one is close to 70% above bid. So um, it's really great to hear the department talk about how um, things can unroll. Um, we see this as a huge opportunity to bring in um, Angelinos um, from underserved areas to uh, our city workforce through the targeted like we'll hire program with the entry level positions. So um, we hope we're all thinking about that. Thanks. Thank you. We look forward to working with you. Uh, so without objection, we will note and file this report. Um, that brings us to, we have no other items. We have general public comment. Um, general public comment, first we have Mr. Uh, Spindler. Let the record reflect, he's not here. And we have Ms. Uh, Ramirez. Ms. Ramirez here? She is. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, the city of Los Angeles is dangerously uninhabitable. We have ugly, nasty, violent, drug trafficking pigs and human smuggling, racist, hate mongering, chango Latino wetbacks, and the and monumental gang epidemic that the city of Los Angeles has failed to address. Yes, Los Angeles is very unsafe and we are under siege. There is no public safety for legal law abiding citizens and nor for our beloved United States military veterans. The Los Angeles City City Council public assholes are too busy once again unlawfully subsidizing all these criminal diabolical deviant wetbacks and jungle gangbangers. Poverty and homelessness now dominates all of Los Angeles and California. Hence, let us fervently recall, recall all these corrupted, freeloading son of a bitches. And they are Eric Garcetti, who never delivered on any of his promises. And um City Attorney Michael Fewer, who never prosecutes cases against gang violence and gang uh, Thank stalkings. Thank you. This meeting's adjourned. Thank you very much. Hatimatova to the good Jews. Thank you.